Thank you, Acting Speaker. And I rise to speak on the Food Substance Amendment Bill 2020. And um, I stand here as the lead speaker uh, and as um, the responsible um, shadow minister for health uh, in the lower house, Emma Kelly, is on maternity leave. So I just thought I'd make mention um, that she'll be returning. So this is my last time representing her as the lead speaker. Um, but obviously, with my health background, I've enjoyed uh, the opportunity. And I just thought I'd take a moment to um, talk about the fact, before I begin, if you don't mind, that um, we're, with some young mums coming into the parliament in the next couple of weeks, with Emma and Steph, the member for Lowen and the member for... Um, uh, what's Steph the member for? <laughs> I can't remember, but I'm sure it'll go into the hands of... Um, yeah, the, the, there's, I just thought I'd mention that, you know, we've had a lot of um, challenges in the last few weeks with sitting dates being moved around, and, uh, and we often don't get uh, notice of sitting dates for the next year until very um, shortly before we actually start to sit. And it's um, not unusual, or perhaps it's not really happened much before, where we're going to have... Uh, two members in the House who will have young babies and hopefully be, um, you know, having them coming to the House with them so they can uh, really have that experience not taken away from them. Because I just thought I'd mention to, that it's important for the government to remember that um, uh, the member for Lowen will be travelling, you know, over four hours to get to the House and she won't, you know, she'll have to be arranging babysitters or bringing carers with her. So it's something I think we should all remember that this place is uh, a workplace and uh, the government says that they support women and it's certainly difficult when you don't get any notice of meeting dates if you're a, a mum who's trying, or a dad, and you're trying to organise care for your children. So um, given that these uh, two um, members will be returning with young children and live quite a distance away, I think it's, um, I just thought I'd bring that to the attention of the government to perhaps consider. But now um, I'll move on to the bill at hand, and this is a bill that um, amends the Food Act of 1984 and the Public Health and Wellbeing Act of 2008 to support the introduction and implementation of an online platform for compliance management of food and catering businesses across Victoria's local government areas. So just a bit of background. Um, following the handing down of the 2018 Business Regulation Review, the Department of Health and Human Services recommended reforming food safety regulations and regulatory burden costs for businesses and local councils to implement that um, to, to a single online platform for regulatory compliance ease. So currently, they, um, councils have the responsibility, but uh, this is basically an online portal um, that will make it easier, hopefully, for the councils to um, cut red tape. It won't actually reduce regulation. It will actually, hopefully, reduce the um, red tape or the regulatory burden that sometimes the Food Act will be interpreted uh, as, where it's not the actual Food Act that's, that's, that's the challenge, it's the interpretation. So with 79 councils across the state, there can sometimes be 79 interpretations. And when you've got businesses, food um, businesses, that have premises in uh, several councils, that can be quite challenging for them to have different interpretations, such as an example where one council might interpret the Food Act to say that you need to have stainless steel around the back of your um, stove and oven areas, whereas with a pizza oven that might be completely ridiculous and one might um, interpret that it's necessary. So it's, it's that sort of um, complication and, and frustration that the... Um, a small business um, regulation review identified after consulting with these businesses. And I'm, I'm sure all, all the members in here would often have um, constituents who own these food businesses coming frustrated saying, you know, we've, we, we just don't know how to work with this because it's just too onerous. So um, I, I welcome um, the fact that the government are looking at making this easier because particularly uh, during COVID, uh, the hospitality industry has suffered greatly, probably one of the most affected. There are, there are quite a few groups that have been most affected, but they are up there as one of them. So we, anything we can do to make uh, the regulatory burden easier is a good thing. And on that note, it's interesting to look at... People say that, uh, you know, in opposition, all you do is um, attack and whinge and... Um, but, but the reality is, in this place, um, in the 58th Parliament, actually, that I was my first um, Parliament that I was elected to, there were 80% um, of the bills that went through the Parliament were actually unopposed. 
as will be the case with this one. Um, when something's a good idea, you work towards making it happen. And I think this is a very good idea. Um, and obviously, that doesn't take away your responsibility as an opposition to ensure that you consult and that you um, look for any challenges uh, back in your electorate in, or across um, the portfolio if you're the shadow to make sure that uh, any unintended consequences are are identified and, and addressed. And that's what we're here to do, just to debate that situation. And there are some concerns which I will talk about, but overarchingly, I think it's a very good idea that we, um, we get a, a way forward for um, businesses to have their uh, um, permits issued and the complications and confusions uh, that have occurred, occurred to warrant this change um, get sorted. Um, so, <laughs> The, it, the Food Safety uh, Act is a, an act that it should uh, protect us from all sorts of things. And one of those is, um, you know, disease from, um, you know, food being prepared in a way that ends up with people getting sick. Such an example of that is salmonella. So with this portal, it will also uh, mean that real-time... Um, action can take place if there's an outbreak of something like salmonella, and, and that's, that's a really good outcome that we'd, we'd want to see. At this point in time, there are five um, companies that are already, the different 79 councils around the state are working through that provide this service. So for this to actually work, the government um, taking this on, they will need, it's actually an opt-in system, it's not a um, mandatory system, um, but there will have to be at least 70% of the councils wanting to come on to this for it to be cost effective. And I'll get into costs and the concerns around that at a bit later. But um, I look at the history of food safety because obviously um, coming from the dairy industry and producing a food on farm and exporting that product uh, as we did to about 49 countries around the world, uh, our clean green image um, and people's health and well-being and, and safety, food safety has always been important to me. So just to, at fear of sounding like the member for Essendon, I just thought it might be interesting to note that um, the first food safety law in England was in the 1200s. So that's how far back um, these sorts of laws go. And that was around bread and the ingredients. More interestingly, Germany's was around beer and making sure people get, didn't get sick from... Uh, and that was in the 1400s from the consumption of beer. So, you know, that's very fascinating. I always found that uh, a really interesting piece of trivia that I thought I'd share with the Parliament. Um, so what are some other things about this bill that, uh, that I should identify so you can understand why um, I think it's a good idea? And, and what some of those are that... Um, I probably should note that it also... Um, the bill also has some miscellaneous amendments to enhance the administration of... Uh, primary food production and processing standard for eggs and egg products and uh, seed sprouts. Hence my thoughts around the salmonella because uh, um, the egg industry do a fantastic job in Australia um, with uh, food, food safety and the processes we have in all our agricultural sectors are very impressive and that's why we've earned as a nation and as a state our reputation of being so good at food production. Um, so... Um, so, uh, interestingly too, this, this uh, will affect the mobile food vans that produce food. And you've all been to festivals and um, unfortunately many of them have been cancelled from the pandemic's perspective causing that. And we've seen our you know, folk festival in Port Ferry cancelled and many of our activities, which is, you know, let's hope very soon we can get back to uh, supporting those festivals. But... Uh, so those food vans that would be at these festivals, um, there's 30,000 of them across the state that operate. So very important that uh, we make sure uh, we make things easier for them because they often go through many um, councils. So it would be really quite onerous for them as small business operators to be getting permits. Um, Particularly uh, of note was the fact that they um, also talked about that this portal um, New South Wales is looking at as well, which would be great because, um, you know, festivals that uh, these uh, businesses go to aren't just in Victoria because uh, in electorates like mine, South Australia is not far away and crossing the border is something we usually do quite, quite regularly, not so much at the moment. Um, so I thought I would also um, talk about the fact that one of the worrying concerns when we did the consulting for this bill was 
The fact that the government told us during the bill briefing that they had consulted twice with each council, and so they had consulted extensively. But what I've um, uh, received emails um, we, when we've done our consultation as an opposition from many councils, both city and country, and they're very concerned that the consultation process did not um, talk to them about the cost of this. Uh, they certainly talked about the, car, the design, but they didn't uh, talk of, of the portal. But they didn't um, uh, be made aware that there was, you know, there would be a cost. So that. That's a very big concern. I think we all know, particularly in the rural councils, um, the way uh, they're struggling to get enough uh, rates in with uh, some councils from uh, that the income is just not there. And for them to have to manage uh, all the assets like ovals and um, or provide the services like aged care, uh, hack services, home and community care services. They're just really struggling. So another cost on that council would be absolutely uh, abhorrent. And um, you know, from one of the um, emails where one of the local councils said, it seems unreasonable to expect local government to pay to have to use a system which is required by the state without, without especially without consultation. So they say there that they haven't had consultation about that. And they note that we have not budgeted, budgeted for this or been informed of the level of cost involved. And so what the last thing we want to see is uh, more cost on the government. If I couldn't get at the bill briefing confirmation of how much the um, government have budgeted to build this um, portal. So the last thing we need is for costs to blow out and for those costs to be passed on to businesses. Um, because you know after you've had a pandemic where hospitality have been absolutely smashed, you know, we need to do everything we can to support businesses. And, um, you know, I know that the Moynshire, for example, have actually waived a lot of the charges uh, from the, uh, that they would normally charge because they're so acutely aware of the business's uh, viability at the moment. But, um, you know, another thing we could do as well is rather than, you know, I looked at the, the, um, some of the premises at the moment who are struggling under the COVID rules of 10 per room up to 40 indoors. And some of these premises are huge, especially out in the regions where we have a lot of space. Um, you know, the bowls clubs, some of these are sporting clubs that are, you know, run by um, committees and, and they're really struggling to uh, get through this pandemic. And when you've got massive square metres available and you've only got 10 people in the room. I wonder, as a previous business owner, how they would manage the costs of turning on the lights, the heating and, and employing the chef um, to be able to even put on a meal for 10 people. So uh, why wouldn't it be smart to actually say, well, look, it's one, one person per four square metres. And then that's sort of one standard rule. Obviously, we need restrictions during this period. We need to uh, um, make sure we don't, uh, you know, compromise what we've achieved, but it just seems a bit unfair when, um, you know, there's all this space that uh, it can't be used more effectively. So, and the other thing I sort of worry about with this bill is that um, whilst the costs haven't been shared, um, when we look at the history of the Labor government's ability to uh, manage uh, IT systems, there's a long, long history of of stuff ups, and uh, we only have to think of what happened with Vines Victoria very recently. Uh, births, deaths, and marriages is another one where the government just doesn't seem to be able to um, oversee a systems management uh, situation that, and have major, major stuff ups. And that's very embedded in the Labor, Labor government. If you go back to uh, the Mikey uh, development of Mikey, and um, what about HealthSmart? Whoa, what a what a waste of money that turned out to be, and. You know, was it 323 million that was set aside, and then after several years of spending that money, they needed another three, uh, 200 and some ridiculous amount of millions. So 320 million initially, and wanted another 230 million, I think it was, and then you know the whole thing was just a, an appalling mess. So that's my concern that uh, we give this job to the government. The idea is great, but um, there are history with managing. Uh, IT systems is appalling, and and I don't know what it is about. They seem to have a uh, an abhorrence to actually being able, you know, they've got to just do it themselves or not learn from anyone. Because you know, at the moment we're all going out in our electorates, and and um, now I'm here in Melbourne. I'm, I'm trying to support the businesses in Melbourne uh, in the going out and eating at night, and 
the government has seen New South Wales do a really, really good job of contact tracing. And we're nine months into the pandemic, nine months into the pandemic, and yet the government still hasn't managed to get a system in place like QR codes, for example, which is what New South Wales are using. Yet businesses have been open for a very short period of time, as in hospitality restaurant businesses, but I go into them and here they, they've got their QR codes up and running. Why wouldn't we be doing that as a state through a coordinated approach? Why are we leaving businesses to have to try and do their best? And even a few weeks ago when I was going, um, when, the, when we opened up the restaurants in uh, and the cafes in uh, the regions, you know, these young kids were grateful to be back at work, but they were being asked to take contact details, um, ask people where they were from, get evidence of whether they were from a postcode that was allowed out of the Ring of Steel or not. You know, and it was just so difficult for the businesses. It was all onus placed on them and massive fines if they didn't comply. People were terrified, and um, I think we shouldn't forget that, particularly when we look at New South Wales and uh, we see how well they've done. And and they've got a system in place. Can we just copy it? Nine months later and we're still... So, you know, whilst I'm very supportive of, of, of making it easier for businesses uh, to not have to have heaps of red tape, I'm very concerned about the ability of the government to actually uh, deliver this, actually roll it out and deliver it. So, uh, and, you know, these, these fears are fairly, um, fairly reasonable given, as I've said, the history of uh, the Labor government's ability when we look at what I said, fines Victoria, how many fines went, didn't go out and mismanagement of that, the birth, deaths and marriages. I had people coming to my office just needing to get a, a death certificate from their recently passed partner and, you know, these elderly people were just so, so devastated. They couldn't get, you know, power turned on or all sorts of issues were uh, resulting from it. So I think, you know, there's, um, there's quite a, a reasonable concern there when you look at how embedded this, this problem has been in the past. So um, the other thing I thought I would mention is the government this week have had a pretty rotten week. The bills that they've put forward have had um, problems and we've had to have amendments come back. We saw uh, the member for uh, Fern Tree Gully stand... Uh, was it the member for Fern Tree Gully earlier, I think? Near, um, Neil Angus? Was it Sorry. Neil? Forest Hill, thank you. So members for Forest Hill, uh, where his, the bill that he, um, you know, caught the Working with Children uh, Act had actually been repealed. So the government is really in a bit of a shambles. And, and that is something I thought I would bring to the attention as, as well of the Health Minister, that uh, there's some spelling errors in the bill. So maybe he needs to think about a House amendment because uh, uh, there was one word I'm... Um, I think it was in, Dem uh, in, in oh, I can't remember what the word was, but it was meant to be identify, and I looked up the word and it didn't have any spelling in any Google search that I could find that there was any word like it. So, you know, this government's had, oh, I don't know how many more staff than, than ever before. So it's a bit of a shame that uh, we're not taking responsibility. Legislation shouldn't be... Uh, coming to the House with uh, errors like we've seen. And I think this is the third bill that has an error in it. So, um, you know, I, I just respectfully suggest to the, to the Health Minister that uh, he have a look at that spelling error. I, I'll, I'll happily send it through to him and identify it at, uh, in the... Um, I think it was Section 19 of the Act, actually. But, um, yeah, so, you know, it's, it is really concerning when, uh, you know... We've got uh, a minister who probably shouldn't be accepting that sort of standard. I mean, spell check's not that hard, and this is a word that isn't actually a word, so I'm sure spell check would have identified it. Um, but look, overarchingly, I think the fact that um, we will have real-time ability for the health inspectors in the uh, 79 councils able to go and um, if there is an outbreak of something like salmonella that they can jump on that quickly and that keeps our community um, more protected than we already are but you know we say I say that knowing we do a very good job um, at this point but you know improvement continuous improvement cycles is something I'll always support um, so you know the fact that the health inspectors will have a, a tool probably like an iPad is what they're suggesting, that they can go to businesses and instead of this uh, anomaly between businesses and this frustration, I mean, I remember, a, and this, this bill does apply to the um, beauty sector as well, who have really been um, 
compromised during the pandemic and still are in a situation where they haven't been respected for the knowledge they have on um, infection, uh, can, you know, cross-contamination cross of infection, which they're well trained in, and that's why we don't see in the health industry um, outbreaks of... Uh, um, blood-borne viruses going from one person to another because they um, have been fully aware of the responsibility in that area for a long time. So for them to be left to so late in the restriction easing uh, is, is actually you know, disrespectful and I think uh, they're struggling and trying to put their case forward. But this bill actually does affect them because the health inspectors go to the beauty therapists as well and, and check on their premises. So um, the fact that uh, I remember a girl coming to me and she said, you know, I've got a health inspector saying that I need to have a tap here, it makes no sense. I've, you know, so that sort of stuff will be able to be um, more clearly worked out for people and the businesses will know with, with absolute assurity that there's consistency between the 79 councils and those, um, those 79 councils won't have 79 interpretations of the Act. So as I said, I support the bill. Um, I do have some, some concerns. Um, I worry that because the government can't seem to get systems management right, and that's been an embedded problem for a long time, that uh, we do as an opposition need to bring that to the attention of the, of the House so that we can have that noted and watch carefully. Um, I, I worry for the councils that there's been no consultation about the cost. Um, and particularly note that regional councils cannot afford extra costs, can't carry that cost. Businesses can't have that cost. So it's so important that this management tool actually comes in at a price that is affordable. And the government has mentioned a price of around $15 to $20 per business. So that needs to be delivered, not, um, not blown out and cost blowouts, uh, as we saw um, the Grattan Institute even talk about last week or this week, um, of how the three big build uh, projects on the government's agenda of the uh, have blown out collectively to a, a whopping great big figure of $11 billion, which is an absolute disgrace. And taxpayers really are in a situation where they're watching closely. They're watching closely. They want their leaders to invest well, but they want them, you know, to in infrastructure projects, and I hope we see a lot of that in um, the regions as well as the city in the up-and-coming budget, which is only two weeks away. We do, and in South West Coast we need, not want, we need the hospital um, to be completed, stage two. How can you start something and six years later still not complete it and have no... Well, that's right, that's what they do. That's exactly right, member for Forest Hill, not the member for Fern Tree Gully. Um, so, yes, we... We do need some of those projects and, and look, I'm more than comfortable to see um, investment so that our communities get the infrastructure they need. But I'm very worried about waste and uh, I know business people are very focused on waste. You have to be in business. So anything that reduces waste and um, streamlines their, their costs is good and I think that, that the bill will do this if, if the system designed by the government actually is able to come in at a reasonable cost. It is a big if, and as I said, the member for Forest Hill he wasn't here when I mentioned the fact that the government haven't had a good history of that. So they're, they're uh, just recently, the Fines Victoria disaster, uh, very... Not, Mikey, well, that's what I said. This problem goes back a very long time, embedded in Labor government's behaviour of not being able to... Um, you might actually have more knowledge about the Health Smart um, debacle of millions and millions of dollars. Uh, oh, no, I can't remember what it was called either. So, but there's, there's, there is a, an endless list. So um, I note with caution that um, the councils have, um, have been very uh, looking forward to businesses having this opportunity in their, in their, electric, in their councils, um, but um, the cost is significant that they want... Uh, well, they want... The problem to them of the cost is wanting to be some knowledge that it will be uh, the 15 to $20 that it already costs at the moment and no more. So on that note, I think I will conclude with those concerns noted. Um, I, we don't oppose the bill and I sincerely hope this uh, outcome of assisting businesses um, at this time couldn't be something we would all not want for, for business, particularly hospitality who have struggled and the beauty industry. Thank you.